Hi everyone, this is Jill Hurston. Uh, welcome to our Zip Chat today. I'd like to introduce our host, Mike Watson. He's our VP of Engineering at CenterZip. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Jill. And welcome everyone to today's session. Uh, it's Zip Chat episode 10, Technology Trends and Predictions in 2021. Today I've got a panelist of Makun Rajmanar. <laughs> He's a director of engineering here at CenterZip. I also have David Farmer with me, CEO at Ad Giants. Thanks for joining, David. And then I also have Mar Arun Ruchananti, who is VP of product at Vocera. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, trends and predictions as we've discovered through our own survey. So a pseudo-scientific survey conducted by our marketing team of our clients here at CenterZip. Uh, trying and other influencers around the Centers of Network, uh, trying to get a good idea of what people are thinking about going into 2021. Uh, we've got some good insights, and with that, I think I'll just jump into it. Um, let's start, though, by a quick poll. Awesome. Okay, so, well, Mike, can you see today the poll? Is, yeah, is your organization expecting to go back to pre-COVID operations this year? Um, this one is of an interest to me. Um, just wondering where people's heads are at. I think most people are still probably in a waiting mode, but let's see what the results say. All right, do you have, do you have the results, Jill? I do, most of the people have voted. So I'm gonna close that and share the results with you. There you go. Yeah, so the, the biggest group here is the uh, waiting to decide group, uh, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's still kind of unclear what's going on out there. All right, cool. Um, let's move on from there to uh, get the panel involved. Uh, my first question here is aimed at Arun. So Arun, uh, the COVID pandemic has really left its mark on society and business, quite obviously, it's maybe an understatement. It certainly has kickstarted a technology revolution in healthcare and telemedicine, however. So what are, I know you're in that space, what are you seeing Wow, um, you know, it's uh, thanks uh, for that quick introduction. Um, I um, been in this field in the healthcare industry for 20 years, and it has really taken an act of God, frankly, to get some of the laggards in the healthcare industry moving uh, towards digital transformation. So COVID has really um, created new opportunities for all sorts of uh, healthcare IT companies to uh, make inroads into an area where the technology always existed, the infrastructure always existed. Uh, what was missing was the desire and the, what I call the intestinal gut of the, the players in the health systems to actually open doors and, and make that an option. Uh, and clearly COVID made sure that, you know, the only way to survive was to embrace uh, digital transformation and many of the health systems have done that. One of the colleagues I was talking to who uh, is part of uh, a well-known tele telehealth company called Amwell uh, was mentioning that in their space the adoption of telehealth uh, has gone from 1% before pre-COVID like in last March to almost 51% of appointments in hospitals are now done through telehealth platform that Amwell makes, for example. So that's just an example of how uh, that has changed. In our space, which is in the clinical communication space, um, we've done some product pivoting, uh, leverage some of the technologies that we already had to allow more collaboration and communication amongst clinicians especially as they go into these uh, you know isolation wards where once you go in it's a big process to kind of you know uh, doff all your equipment and then come out so in order for them to not have to go back and forth between these environments they've started leveraging a lot of Vocera's technology which was already there but they just didn't have that um, you know insights into how to use it so we've made some product transformations like that and many of my colleagues in other companies that serve the healthcare industry have told me that you know simple modifications of their technology are now being, for example, used for uh, uh, doing the uh, contact tracing within hospitals. So you know they had 
leverage the uh, RTLS technology, but now they're using it for contact tracing and making sure that, you know, once you go into a patient's room, uh, you are not, you know, coming out and then uh, infecting others uh, through, through use of some basic technology. So lots happened in the last, I would say, six months. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, definitely what I've seen. Um, David, just real quick, in your business, have you seen a change in how things are operating? I know you're in a totally different uh, space there. Yeah, I mean, our model for our company has always been a distributed remote approach, um, but advertising agencies as a whole have always been within a building. Um, I think what you're seeing is is what Arun was saying, it, you know, God kind of did this mighty swath and made us all face this in a certain way. And if you look back like maybe 20 years ago, there were big companies like IBM that were trying the remote office work. They had these huge campuses um, and they were trying to keep costs down. So they were they were actually trying out a lot of remote stuff. And I think it's not a unique idea. I think a lot of people have always thought about, man, how much money could we save? if our businesses were remote and our employees were able to kind of work from home on certain days and we could use the office differently. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, no one was ever had the guts to try it. They were all, it was almost like one of those things, well, we don't have to do it. So it's kind of a scary thought. Well, then we were all thrust into having to do it. And I think that it, it proved out what everybody kind of felt in their gut that this could work. I think it was a holdover from the days of when maybe people were irresponsible and slept at their desks or something like that, or wouldn't call, they'd call in <laughs> sick. So employers always thought, you know, well, if I don't have him sitting at his desk chained to it, he isn't going to work. I think they found out that people are actually a lot more accountable than they gave him credit for uh, and more task oriented. So I think the remote thing is catching on. I, I'm glad I'm not in commercial real estate. I, I mean, I think that they've got a huge challenge, obviously. But um, I do think that this is something that will never go back. I don't think we'll ever see it like it was before. I think we're going to see some hybrid um, because like Arun was saying in the medical industry, you know, this now crosses over to a lot of different fields and ad giants um, is def definitely taking advantage of that and that we're offering basically a chief marketing officer on your phone remotely. So we go out and we find CMOs that have either been on the agency side or the client side and we say, you no longer have to go live in a major market to make the kind of money you want to make. You can go live on a lake somewhere. As long as you're connected, we can tie you into our ecosystem and our customers online. And now the, the customers are willing to do business like that. We see telemedicine, we see um, lawyers on your phone, human resource people on your phone, this, this, this sort of on-demand mod, uh, modern day kind of approach to service businesses is now mainstream. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Makun, um, in Synergip, we've also seen some changes like that as well, right? Um, in terms of work from yeah. home versus work remote. Can you briefly go over what we've done? So, we were about a 500 uh, uh, person company uh, in a single location uh, in our development center in Pune. And we went to all work from home model uh, when the pandemic struck. And um, Work from home was already part of, uh, you know, that was already enabled in Synergip uh, per se. So when the pandemic struck and everybody, uh, we went through the lockdowns and everybody had work from home, uh, the transition uh, was uh, seamless. Uh, we have uh, not only uh, been able to service our existing customers, we have been able to attract new business and uh, customers have also expressed satisfaction over how the kind of, uh, uh, you know, response they are getting from Synergip. Uh, in this new environment and looks like we'll be staying in this model uh, for the foreseeable future uh, with you know as an as need basis people using the uh, office uh, so we're still in the wait and watch field but uh, looks like you know remote work has worked well for us yeah and, and I've seen a lot of technology investments and we all have in companies that support remote work in various different aspects um, uh, the other thing that's interesting for me is I've been a remote worker for over eight years and my wife for 16 years, uh, just the nature of our jobs and through acquisitions and not being in the same place as our headquarters or whatever. Um, so it's interesting to see everyone else join the way that we've been working for so long. Um, and also it's great to see that it's working very effectively, even for teams who are able to use tools like Slack and 
Microsoft Teams or whatever to to stay in communication and keep sort of that group dynamic. That's one thing I'm definitely seeing within Centerzip is that we're able to do that. So I'm assuming, um, you know, just maybe through a thumbs up from everyone that we're it, all kind of in a wait and see, probably not going back any anything close to uh, what was pre-COVID. I mean, definitely in centers up, we're not not looking to go back. Other other than the health uh, safety aspects, yeah, we don't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, it, it has been very effective and uh, I think we're seeing good productivity. So let's bring up another poll. Um, I'm interested in the audience's view of where they're planning to invest. And I picked a few areas here for people to look at, um, cloud operations, serverless, AI, ML. And in cloud operations, I mean, you know, taking more of your operations to the cloud if you're not already fully cloud. Um, I'd like to hear everyone's opinion. Um, so Mike, I do have the poll open waiting for our audience. Can you see the poll? Yeah, I see it. Okay, great, thanks. So Aruna, Vocera, are you, do you have a lot of cloud operations? I, I'm not too aware of your operational side of your business. You know, we move uh, at the speed of healthcare and <laughs> uh, more and more uh, health systems and the CIOs I speak to now are uh, leaning towards not getting into the business of not having to run the business of you know traditional data centers and they are moving their basic operations into cloud but it's still ways to go what about you at uh, ad giants david um i'm assuming mostly cloud there yeah all cloud mm -hmm. yeah that's that's what i would expect okay so we've got a tie between cloud operations and ai ml that totally makes sense to me um so the this last section that we talked about, we were sort of talking about the current environment and related to COVID. So we're gonna move off of that and then more into some more technical areas. Um, so uh, RPA was one of the things on the list. So I wanted to talk about that. That stands for Robotic Process Automation. And it's interesting, I was talking to a CIO at a bank recently, uh, a private wealth management company actually. And she was mentioning that uh, they expect low productivity from the US after this year, like there should be some productivity gain, but it'll be reduced um, as we're pushing growth forward through our monetary policy, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so it made me think about RPA. And is RPA a way to help us with that productivity growth? What do you think about that, Makun? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the primary driver for RPA adoption uh, has been uh, productivity and business resilience um, during the uh, pandemic uh, and the lockdowns that happened you know there were a lot of services which we take for granted that kept working uh, in many cases and uh, these were uh, you know helped uh, in some industries at least by the use of uh, automation through rpa and uh, the other couple of benefits are you know they want to move you can once you automate operations uh, at the repetitive work, uh, you are also able to move people to a more uh, higher level of value, and also you are able to cut costs. So RPA definitely has a major role to play. The growth of RPA still continues, and this year I think Gartner is looking for about a 19% growth at least. And uh, every year it has been uh, pretty much, uh, uh, you know, increasing. So that trend is going to continue. So Makun, from your observations, have, have you seen that this is primarily more an enterprise level, you know, Fortune 500 type companies, or is it really applicable across the board in your mind? It's not just the Fortune 500 companies. I think there are a lot of areas where the application is. Uh, there are different variations of it. The one is uh, assisted RPA, for example, operator assisted. So if you're on a call center talking to someone and uh, uh, the call center person has to pull up your account, you know, do some uh, processes to, you know, maybe uh, remove a lock on your credit card as an example, or put a lock on it or things like that, right? Uh, there are assisted uh, uh, robotic processes which help with that. Uh, and also with regard to, uh, you know, the usage is uh, on a variety of segments. Uh, and it's not just limited to enterprise applications. Gotcha. So, um... So one of the things came up in the poll was cloud operations being a big focus for folks, um, and it's definitely on our list. So, uh, you know, I found in talking to mid-sized companies, 
that uh, cloud adoption is not as mainstream as you might think. Uh, you, know, you think that smaller and mid-sized companies are a little more agile. It just really kind of depends on where you're at. So David, what do you think now is motivating people to move more into the cloud operations or move more of their operations into the cloud? Well, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with the whole pandemic and outsourced uh, localization kind of approach where it's lighter, lighter is better. And the cloud certainly provides that lightness. I think the reason you see small to medium sized businesses really embracing it more is also cost. I think some of the larger behemoth companies, they're just so set in their ways traditionally. Um, again, I refer back to Arun's healthcare model, you know, I have a lot of family members in healthcare and they're like, you know, trying to move the Titanic with a tugboat. I mean, it's ridiculous. So it's it's the same sort of thing. And I think that you're going to see the smaller companies embracing it faster because uh, they get more cost effectiveness out of it. I think the challenge that you're going to see in the cloud are everyone kind of rushed to it like a gold rush. So Slack, for example, was very quick out there to have this, you know, day to day team experience type thing. And the next thing you know, there's 12 more apps just like it. And then there's that fragmentation of the market, like which one's the best. And I think the hardest part you see is people will try something for a month or two and then they'll get sick of it and they'll try something else. And no one's adhering to any sort of a standard. And so no one's rising up as that standard in that cloud based, you know, job, whatever it's role it's providing. So I think that as a, as a company, you have to make sure you vet these things properly, not just for short term gain, but what you can stick with for a while. Um, so that, I think that's going to be the real challenge, but I think it just goes hand in hand with remote working. Cloud is just so much better because you're not having to take everything with you. It's more accessibility and it's more cost effective. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Rune, do you yeah, have can any? I add, can I add there? something to that on on the healthcare side? One of the changes that uh, that's happening as far as adoption of uh, cloud in healthcare now is that the cloud applications are typically uh, subscription based for the most part right i mean it's not necessarily one is to one but most cloud services are you know you pay as you go per month kind of thing and that in the health systems operational i mean budget sense comes out of the operations budget versus buying technology for you know out of capex and what's happened over the last several years is that as the funding has been squeezed and you know as healthcare systems uh, health systems operate on smaller and smaller margins. It's much harder for them to go and make these big capital expense purchases because they have to go back to their trustees or you know, in some cases issue bonds in local muni markets, which has become harder uh, for some. And it's a lot easier for them to justify, you know, adjusting their operational expenses uh, small because like one of the CIOs was telling me, hey, I can, you know, always squeeze some you know few hundred thousand dollars out of my operational cost and try a new cloud-based app but if that app was all on-prem and i had to you know worry about multi-million dollar justification for cap capex that that is becoming harder and harder so i think some of those economic dynamics are also making a difference in, in healthcare yeah that's interesting one of the things that i heard last year so this is kind of a last year thing uh, maybe still true is um especially in the IT side of operations, where a lot of things were done in CapEx on-prem and pushing everything to the cloud has created this um, unfortunate side effect of these operational costs are showing up at you know, a different part of the balance sheet or the different part of the, the financials. And it's you know, changing the way that your you know, revenues look like and your EBITDA and all that. So you know, it's kind of a shock to some companies where they're, they, don't, they didn't realize the impact it would have on, on their actual financials. I mean, it's still probably better and they wouldn't make a different choice but um, and certainly you know when you get into that capex versus operational expense uh, it, it creates some anxiety sometimes yeah it's, it's a difficult Industry. transition for several industries yeah and that one of the points for the transition is uh, many companies try to do lift and shift uh, without actually working through how to optimize the migration to the cloud and i think lift and shift is where uh, they are going to see more expensive uh, uh, more expenses when they actually move move off from. So that Very is some, that's an area where people need to have a you know pay, pay close attention to. Yeah, if you're not leveraging the cloud services and the pay per use uh, side of the cloud, then you certainly can rack up the expenses and, then, like I said, also shift it in a different place <laughs> in your uh, financials. So 
Well, that, that was it. actually that was actually the beauty of enterprise for a long time. I had my previous company was an enterprise software company. We were SaaS, and you kind of held your customers hostage because you had so much of their data tied up in your system that migrate if they wanted to change migrating them off, you know, was a big deal. So a lot of them would just go, nah, I'll just leave it here. So it, the, the cloud has actually given people an option now to be a little bit more nimble. Yeah, yeah, it's and the tools to avoid that lock-in are better, uh, yeah. definitely. Okay, so um, let's move on to a slightly different topic. So, um, so let's talk about Internet of Things. So that's that's kind of been out there. We've been talking about it. It's gaining traction in a lot of areas, and uh, I'm seeing that's probably going to gain more traction, even more traction this year. So I'm I'm wondering, Arun, I know that you sort of your company is sort of dabbling in this. What are you seeing in terms of Internet of Things, and what's motivating uh, the increase? I mean, is it good marketing from the from the mobile carriers and their 5G marketing, or is it you know they're a real thing here? You know, that's uh, that's an int very uh, interesting question. We've not been dabbling, by the way. Uh, we might we uh, we've been building Internet of Thing device without knowing it for last 20 years. You know, we first started this journey with a wearable that was voice controlled for communication within hospitals before there was such a thing called Internet of Things or 5G or what have you. But um, it's it's taken a long time, but it's, you know, it's really culmination of several forces at the same time that has made this possible. I mean, we are in like a fourth generation of revolution. If you look across the history of uh, science and, and technology, you know, it started with the steam engines, then it went into the electricity and the uh, the, the telegraph. Then came the you know the, the onset of the computers and the internet, and now we're finally getting into this new phase where some estimates say that this these connected devices will outnumber the number of people on the planet by like four is to one in the next five to seven years. So there'll be like 30 billion of these connected devices that would uh, all be feeding off of uh, the cloud and the, the, the data that they generate would be used for the AI and you know machine learning types of uh, operations. Uh, of course, you know, the, the uh, the availability of bandwidth and the low latency of 5G is another force that's making it possible. So it's really taken all of these elements to come together. There's the compute power at the fingertips, the availability of cloud, the availability of 5G and the fast low latency uh, internet, and then this capability called machine learning that has also been made possible through uh, the availability of you know uh, com computation power. Uh, so it's really that that's made this happen. Uh, it's happening in every industry that we know. Healthcare I mentioned obviously with remote monitoring to uh, you know stuff that we do with communication. Uh, you know you've heard about this in transportation. You know Tesla is an IoT for all intents and purposes. So you know it's coming out in all sorts of ways and new applications. Of course every smart plug and smart bulb you have at home uh, is also a form of IoT. But it's really the start of this journey because a lot of what's going to happen is going to depend on how all this information that is being gathered from the sensors and from all of these devices, how is it really used to improve the lives of you know individuals like us and in and, and enterprises. So it's to be seen, but I think all the elements are there for the first time. Yeah, that's great. Um, we definitely see more and more uh, talk about that you know <clears throat> in our in our observations around centers of so um there's a question from the audience uh, that i thought was really interesting uh, it actually came in as a, a pre-question and and uh, i'm just gonna throw this one out there um does anyone know of any like killer uh or you know what's going to be the next killer cloud company like you know what's on the horizon what are you all seeing that could really really take off Mine. By the way, we haven't prepared this. My company. <laughs> this is completely new to everyone. <laughs> it's good. I had to, it's a shameless shell, yeah, but it's true. Yes, Ad Giant sounds like it could. I, really I think what's going to happen is I personally think that it's been kind of coming very slowly, this managed services through the internet. 
uh, and people willing to do the business like you, you've talked about with telemedicine. I mean, five years ago, no one would have thought of going online and talking to their doctor face to face on a computer. They wouldn't have. They were like, I got to see him. He's got to touch me. Right. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see tons more of that across many more industries, which is kind of scary to think is then no one's going to want to leave the house. You know, there's no reason to. So, uh, but I think you're going to see a lot of businesses just go online and and take advantage of the cloud and just that connectivity. Yeah, yeah. I think of cloud as as a as a service provider. You know, there will be cloud companies that exist today that will be providing service, but the killer would not be a company. It would be a set of experiences ultimately that will be enabled through cloud or enabled through machine learning and what have you. But uh, it's hard to predict what that would be. Would that be one company? Would that be several companies? But uh, you know, we are in early stages, but it's one thing is true that it's going to change our lives in ways that we can't imagine right now. I mean, forget the movies of the past, but I think the way machine learning and AI is going to impact all of us uh, is, is, you know, that story is still to be written, but we can see early signs of that. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, the pandemic has forced a lot of things to move online really fast. And uh, since there has been a clean slate uh, and, you know, people are forced into the situation, there are services which are available on my mobile today that were just weren't there a few years ago. Uh, telemedicine, um, it's underplayed, but at least know where I am at. I can do a video consultation. I get a prescription. I can order the prescription right then and there. Uh, I can have my tests done. Uh, there are a lot of uh, great advances uh, which are being made by a lot of companies uh, leveraging online uh, services. I think that's where, uh, like everyone's saying, the uh, uh, next uh, breakthrough would be. Yeah, I don't know. If hard you all... Sorry, my friend. Um, I don't know if you all have noticed this, but like, um, if you look at sales and account management, I mean, that I think that game has changed dramatically too. I mean, salespeople used to always go face to face, and uh, that just isn't a reality now. So, a lot of business is getting done. Uh, over video chats like this where uh, and I think that's a huge transformation of that industry that maybe people haven't realized or haven't really come to grips with so maybe the next killer app is in there somewhere all right so um, so let's talk a little more about technology trends here so um, the topic now is going to be user experience and so um, user experience has you know been on the forefront of my mind for a while. I mean, we see a lot of gain and traction there, but I don't think I don't think it's uh, interestingly maybe the whole uh, community hasn't seen it quite the same way. So it looks like you know UX is something that maybe people were were doing a little bit of or real, real, uh, recognize importance, but now they really see with everyone you know using their handholds for like McCoon is saying like all these services are available to me. Uh, I think this design concept, design first, maybe maybe really taking off even more. So I was wondering, David, I mean, you're kind of, you're kind of in this world. So what do you think? Do you think this is something that's really going to take off? It's really interesting because it makes such a strong statement about our cultures as a whole, because the experience is all about communication, whether it's with your, your ears, your eyes, your mouth, or a combination, it's all about commun communication but more like our willingness to how to communicate and how we're willing to talk and how we're willing to listen. And we knew this was coming years ago. You knew back when they'd say, you know, the average consumer is bombarded by 10,000 images a day or whatever. I mean, you knew it was coming, right? And it's, it's ridiculously huge now. But I mean, when I first started in the ad industry, you would buy a two page New York Times ad full of copy with pictures and people would actually read it that actually read the damn thing, you know? So, excuse me, but, you know, now if we can get them to remember a tagline, you, you, you're successful. So it, it's it's a really sad statement on society, but it may not be. It may be that just, I, I just don't know. People don't have the patience. I mean, I think about when we used to take typing class in school, and now I look at my kids, it's just this. They do everything with their thumbs at micro speed, and I'm thinking they would flip out on a typewriter. They wouldn't know what to do. So. Things change and evolve, and there's a reason for that. And so the user experience has to kind of lead that. And and it and, and I it's kind of a catch catch up game. You know, you catch up to what you think it is, and then something else happens, and then you have to adjust to that user experience. But I think now it's because we're in marketing, we tell all of our customers this. 
when you communicate with with your customers you know understand that they don't have the patience to read they're they're even getting to the point now where if they watch a video it's got to be a TikTok video that's five seconds or whatever it is it used to be a video you could watch for three minutes and it's like gosh they won't read but they'll watch now it's even less than that so it's really just adjusting how you communicate your product and your service and what it is you're trying to get people to do in the most minimalist form and of course then that's going to translate into design and because we're so attached to these smart devices in our hands obviously your canvas is very small and very limited so I think what you're going to see happening is the screen used to be so filled out, then it went to mobile friendly. Now it's going to screen by screen and pulling someone through a question or pulling someone through an experience rather than having it there on one screen. So I think you're going to start to see that it's the way people digest information is going to have to get even more radically changed to keep, to keep up with the aptitude of, of the people we're trying to talk to. I know that sounded all convoluted, but you know, I step back and I just, I've seen the whole paradigm of what marketing communication used to be to what it is today. And it's just mind boggling trying to get someone's attention and get them to even click on something anymore. So it's a, it's a real challenge. And if people don't adapt, and, and, what, and the last thing I'll say is I, I think a lot of the companies that we see, they're 10 years behind the curve. They, they may have a beautiful website or a beautiful app or something like that. And it looks great and stuff like that, but the user experience is 10 years behind. And then when you try to tell them you need to bring it up to today's standards, it freaks them out. They're like, we just paid 50 grand to get that done. You know, and it's like, it felt like it was recent, but it was five years ago, even two years ago is old now. So that that's the hard part, just staying on top of the design demands that are there for this. And I'm sure in technology that you all are bathed in daily, it's it's even harder because UX, UI experts are probably beating their head on a wall till they're bloody trying to figure out a way to make it easier for people because I know I do. It, it keeps me up at night. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I, I have a couple of thoughts around that. One is I'm definitely, you know, practiced typist from, you know, studied it when I was younger. And so I prefer using a computer still over using a phone for most interactions. Um, you know, I, I'm slowly moving away, you know, moving into this more comfort with phones, but I mean, I'm certainly that generation where, where it's harder to adopt, but like you said, kids, they, they don't know any different, right? They don't use their computers. Or my they daughter, grew up on the phone. I mean, the kids today that we're, that we're marketing, communicating to, you know, we're older, time flies, you know, but if you look at the, the age now, we still think about them as 12 year olds and to 16 year olds. These are 30 somethings now. Yep. So they grew up with that iPhone already in their hand and that thumb technology accessibility is already just bleached into them. So, I mean, they don't even, I mean, my kids still use a laptop, but that's only when the phones die. User experience is going to uh, become multimodal. I mean, you've seen now the advent of voice being used as a, you know, uh, secondary user experience. But imagine a situation where you have both a visual experience as well as a audio experience you're interacting with some entity it doesn't have to be a human being uh, but that combined experience is what's going to be much richer than just reading something or just talking into a, a, a speaker right um, yeah. so that's that's another area and with 5g if i can add one of the biggest things that people pro probably don't appreciate because they haven't experienced it in 5g yet is the the fact that it is ultra low latency and what that does is allows you to even have a tactical experience you know imagine being able to reach out and shake hands to a hologram or to to somebody because that latency of by the time you you know reach and the other person uh, you know extends his or her hand that's going to be sent in, in you know sub milliseconds across across the uh, the, the world so one of the biggest thing that 5g is going to do is allow this new dimension of user experience which would be tactical and you know yesterday i saw a little uh twitter uh, somebody had posted a video of a surgeon surgically uh, sewing uh the peel of a banana remotely using 5g network 
I mean, literally he had robotic wow. arms and he was sitting somewhere in Germany and the, the banana was somewhere in LA and they show this video where he peels the, the banana and then he puts it back and then he surgically sues the thing. And that was all done because of 5G, because of that low latency tactile feedback. Wow. That's kind of like the Tony Stark stuff where, you know, he's <laughs> like you said, he's in his laboratory and he's talking to the screen, does this with his hands. I, I don't think we're far from that. I really don't. I know. Yeah, and that, that actually brings to the second point I was thinking about related to this topic, which is, um, you know, how you experience, you know, and how you interact is exactly what you're talking about. Like, it's a totally different way to interact with, with the world or, you know, technology. Um, you know, there you're talking about swiping or, you know, surgery through robotics or whatever. But, but there's even more simple examples of that. Like for instance, I had a customer that was asking for like a one pager on centers of capabilities. And so I went to the marketing team and I'm like, hey, marketing team, you know, you have one of those. And they're like, you know, most people don't look at those anymore. You probably want to send them like a short video with the same information. And because most people consume video and they don't read things like that anymore. So for me, that was a huge eye opener. It's like, I prefer to read things because that's what I've grown up with, but I'm not everybody, right? I'm just one small person in the grand scheme of things. So thinking about all the different experiences and all the different ways you can reach out, I think it's going to be part of that design element that needs to be refactored. Because sure, yeah. what triggered that in my mind, David, is when you said beautiful designs really work well 10 years old. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea that, right? It's, it's still too much, you know, like a website. Um, well, not to spend too much time on it, but let me let me add one more thing, and this is just my personal opinion. Um, I think though you've heard the line, "Everything old again is new again," and um, I think especially in marketing, there's just there's just so many vehicles now to communicate with people, and they're stepping on top of each other. I think you're going to see a resurgence of just basic human interaction, where customer service is going to come back, where you walk around the counter and you shake someone's hand and it's it, the experience of that friendship and that relationship with who you do business with is going to make some sort of a comeback, I think. In that's combination. With that, but. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting um, to see things if they go full circle like that. Well, right, so, I got one other cool thing. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got one other cool thing. Yeah, no worries. Go for it. Customer come in here. And I know we're on a schedule. Let's take two seconds. We had a customer come in. Drive-in theaters, right? Old people pull their cars in, put a thing on their window, all that kind of stuff. This guy has created this new drive-in theater concept that's using the Jumbotron, so you can watch during the day as well. It's not hindered to just nighttime, and everything's Bluetooth. And it's just this whole new experience because of the pandemic, you can't go in a theater. He's like, how can we fix the movies? They're bringing back a whole new chain of these things where you can pull in and have a Bluetooth experience with the Jumbotron. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because. Uh... Uh, drive-in theaters have made a huge comeback uh, in COVID. Yeah. I mean, it's like you said, it's the only way to watch movies, and that you know that way of going out and having an experience. Um, and so to to see that come to the daytime too, that'd be really cool. Yeah, uh, that'd be a cool thing. One uh, other aspect of the user experience, uh, just to give an example, is the improve increase in the compute power on the uh, devices. So, for example, uh, FaceTime on an iPhone. Uh, in the newer versions now does eye correction. So even if you're looking away, it uh, uses AI to make it look like you're looking at the phone. So the other person who's talking to you feels that you're having a face-to-face -face conversation, even if your eye wanders. So now the, uh, the compute power and the uh, algorithms have gotten so better that uh, how do you, uh, what's the plus point of using a FaceTime as using something with Google or somebody else, right? So. Technology and changes. Uh, I think it's leapfrogging, and I think the user experience is the center of what it is now. Mukundi, they can also now do when your mind wanders because so many people have <laughs> ADD, <laughs> and then yeah. continue the conversation even though you're thinking about something else. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, my marketing person slash producer has been in my ear for probably. 25 minutes now wanting me to remind you that we do have an ebook uh, that highlights these trends and uh, what you what you see on the screen now is just sort of like the the summary of all the trends that we've been talking about so please take a look at that ebook you can download it directly off of the go to webinar uh, you should see a link there in the resources um, go ahead and download that and take a look uh, otherwise you can come to centerzip.com and you know find it there as well so um, 
one more topic to talk about. Um, this is an interesting one to me because uh, you know I was uh, a couple of years ago I was really into this blockchain movement and wondering what it was all about and how it tied to data security and all that. And then you know the, the price of Bitcoin went way down and nobody was talking about it anymore. Now Bitcoin has come back and guess what? Everyone's talking about blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency again. So I'm um, I'm wondering, um, Makund, this question's aimed at you. Uh, do you really think this is a true trend? Uh, do you think there's a combination of security and blockchain, or uh, you know something like that that's out there as a emerging trend? I think the um, major factor these days um, for blockchain's popularity is the uh, requirement of trust. Um, everything has moved online, and uh, trust is becoming more and more uh, paramount for all users. Um, in the last elections, for example. Uh, there was so much of uh, information being bombarded. You couldn't tell what was fake, what is right. Um, and uh, everything is going online as well. So people are falling back to trust. And I think that's where blockchain as a distributed ledger helps. Um, even economically, I mean, apart from the, so there was a recent um, uh, uh, agreement made in the in the Asia, for example, there are 15 countries which are uh, opening up to, uh, collaboration for a free trade so now they want people who are there building blockchain technologies which allows buyers and sellers to have some level of trust when you know you have so much of uh, cross-border uh, you know legislation and all that things to get through so uh, and again people are questioning ai because now they want trusted algorithms so if you are saying that your algorithm makes the decision for a human being and it impacts human lives how did you build that algorithm? Uh, ML and AI are only as good as the data which is used to train it. So what is the lineage, lineage of the data? And uh, is this something which is reproducible and guaranteed? So uh, blockchain is definitely picking up a lot for that. And uh, these days we also have blockchain as a service. So we have all the cloud providers uh, like Amazon and Microsoft uh, giving you blockchain available as a service, which makes it kind of easy for you to do, you know, smart contracts and uh, use ledgers. So uh, it is definitely a trend which is uh, picking up. And uh, I think trust and security are where the, I think uh, people, there's a need for it. Ever, and especially now since everything is online, uh, I think that's where the need is going for it. Gotcha. Yeah, the trust trust aspect makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you take any any kind of uh, transaction between entities, right? Um, mm -hmm. Buying and selling a home, you know, doing any kind of transaction, there is an there is a huge sort of cost, economic cost that we are bearing right now for all the middlemen, all the brokers. You know, bank is a broker, and your real estate agent is a broker, and then you know people who hold your escrow is a broker, and they all are middlemen. All they're trying to do is like Mukun said, make sure they trust between the two entities that are ultimately you know, uh, doing the transaction is maintained. All that goes away. All of that goes away because it's all done through blockchain and through you know, security. And it's, it has a big impact on the other things we were talking about you know, with the, the onset of these uh, emergence of these IOTs who are sending data across in the cloud, you know, that is being processed by all the machine learning algorithms. How do you trust all that information? How do you trust that this information is coming from my home through my uh, te telecom carrier into the cloud? All of that trust is gonna be maintained through blockchain. So all of these technologies have a purpose and they're sort of coming together at the right time. Absolutely. Yeah, that all makes sense. Um, so, um, I want to throw up one more poll before we conclude uh, to, to get everyone's uh, view on um, essentially, you know, what what would you like to hear from future Zip chats? Um, and you know, I picked a few technologies here that are that are possibilities. Um, some of these we've talked about in the past. Some of these, uh, you know, we're uh, happy to talk about in the future. Uh, so please let me know your thoughts there. And then after that, I want to go to um, an audience question once we're done with this. Okay, Mike, it looks like everybody's voted, so I'm going to close the poll for you. Awesome. And there's your results. So Internet of Things and AIML. Uh, okay. The results are 
actually the numbers are kind of messed up. <laughs> <laughs> they add up to more than 100, so I'm confused. <laughs> uh, but you can see by the bars that AI, ML, and I, IoT, so that's definitely something we can consider for uh, for future zip chats. That's awesome. So the question that I wanted to, uh, that came from the audience, actually, again, this is a, a question that came in from the registrations is uh, related to AI ML. And I know this is an area of interest to you, Makun, so um, feel free to be the first to answer this, but anyone's welcome. Um, what are the advancements we'll see in AI ML this year? Uh, anything, anything brewing that uh, maybe we're not looking at? Yeah, I think <laughs> the, definitely the, uh, uh, the people in the field are looking at it. So edge-based AI is where the uh, uh, area focuses these days. And we are seeing a lot of uh, need for that because um, if you have an AI model on your phone and then your phone is making a decision using AI uh, right there, and then you are able to interact with that, then you know that your data is not going to somebody's server. Uh, this is something which Apple harps on, right? So you are uh, you are assured some privacy uh, of your interactions or your data. And but on the other hand, for improvement of the service. Uh, these uh, edge uh, AI models send some uh, metadata back to the central system so that the overall experience can be improved. So the term they use is a federated machine learning. I think uh, I think Google started that a while ago. So if you use the Gboard, uh, uh, Google Gboard keyboard, right, uh, uh, which is now available for iOS and Android, uh, that can predict how you type and then make proper suggestions for you. And it does all that on your phone, but then it sends the metadata to Google once in a while, which has nothing to do with your personal data. And that metadata helps to improve the overall model for millions of users. So it is pretty hard to beat something like that uh, because uh, the learning happens on your on your device. Uh, improvements happen globally. So that's a wonderful win-win situation. And a lot of companies are doing that. Uh, it is predicted that this year there will be at least a few hundred papers on federated machine learning. So people are trying for a lot in that. So I think that is an area to look at uh, for uh, ML in this year, uh, mostly because of the everybody wants to do computing on the edge now. And we can do computing on the edge, which was not there before. So the federated aspect, just to clarify, Makun, is the fact that the learning is happening on the edge, right? Like happening at the uh, individual device or um, and not in a not sort of in the collective center. Is that right? You're right. So the, the experience happens in the individual device and uh, metadata, uh, which is nothing to do with your private data, uh, that happens in the central system for overall improvement. Yeah, gotcha. So it influences future learnings, um, that central system, but the actual learning is happening you know, right with the, the user. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I think there's a lot of places you could apply that outside of the example you gave. Um, you know, if you really put your mind to it. So that that's interesting. So one of the trends I've seen in a, uh, AI ML uh, fairly recently is adaptive AI, right? So like uh, learning what to learn next. <laughs> so I mean, that's that's interesting concept. I mean, that, I think that's fairly new, but um, you know, seeing how systems can react to the data they're getting and you know try to learn a different thing based on what they've learned uh, without human intervention is interesting. Uh, I was kind of, reading about yeah. you, know, you guys know about this uh, the Turing model, right? For for AI, I was reading about this uh, uh, item yesterday. I think it was a news item where they had this AI engine write up a news story, like you know, to your point, Mike. What you know how? how it figured out from a bunch of information that was thrown at the engine there was some element of news in it and it puts together the ai engine puts together a little news story as if it was written by a human being you know like a press release or something and they send that to 80000 individuals humans to read and all but 2% of them thought it was actually written by a human being. So talk about a, a learning engine that is so advanced that can take bits and pieces of information and create a viable, you know, written story as if uh, it was written by a human being that, you know, 
99% of the human, you know, humans couldn't actually huh. detect it was artificially written. So, I yeah, mean, that's that's, a, that's mind blowing if you think about. That's very they, interesting. Um, if, you know, that just makes me think. You know, in advertising and marketing, there's always been it's kind of a oxymoron, but ethics and marketing or ethics and advertising, right? Um, and and what's happened recently, you know, not to be political. But one of the big questions I have for technology people like you is there's going to be some point where, you know, we're monitored um, by the FCC, what you can say on the radio, what you can say on TV, blah, blah, blah. And the Internet is really the last bastion that doesn't really have any hard and fast guidelines. And these guidelines are being defined by independent companies. And we see that when we talked about blockchain and security of your information. Here's a company that had basically gone to AWS to spin up their, their whole business, relied on it, they, hold, they held everything, and they didn't really like what was happening with it as AWS, and they turned it off. And the company went out of business. And it's like, well, okay, what is the ethical standards for doing that? And I'm not saying we should have government enter into the, to the internet, as they have in the FCC and other regulations, but I think we're starting to see we're on the precipice of a point where we're understanding the vulnerability of some of these behemoth companies that are holding all our information and what, you know, it's not about someone breaking in and stealing it. It's more like, what are they going to do with it? Do they, what power do they have over my destiny now? I think that's going to be another really big topic, you know, with regards to cloud-based, internet-based securities is, am I safe? You know, is my we'll, company we'll safe? Another, we'll need another hour for that. That's that whole regulation 230 <laughs> and, the, right, you know. Right, right, sorry. Kind of out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, it is a trend First that's going to happen. It is a trend that I mean, we haven't really talked about, you know, in this concept, but you know, understanding, you know, what what these large companies with holding all this data, what rights do they really have uh, to monitor and to deal with uh, situations? And there is there is definitely rules that need to be created. Uh, you know, the community needs to come together for that. Uh, otherwise, it's just one person's opinion versus another, or one company's opinion versus another. And that's that's probably yeah. not the right answer long term. It's constitutional questions to be answered, right? So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It goes a little bit above just freedom of speech. <laughs> yeah, it's more like, there yeah, are already yeah. some groups which focus entirely on the impact of data and society. So, I think the Society by Internet and Center for Internet Society. Then there are multiple. Uh, you know variations of those so especially the impact of social media and the kind of uh, data poisoning or data pumping which happens to public uh, influence the public so there are some thought leader thought uh, there is some thought going on in there uh, yeah i mean so it's AI not like, ethics you know, is a subject now at mit <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well i want to thank everyone uh, on the panel for joining it's been a great discussion really interesting um I like the way you know it all evolved and hearing everyone's opinions on these topics. Um, I want to remind the audience um, that there is an ebook available. Uh, again, you can pull it down as a handout here or uh, go to soonerzip.com to see that. Um, you can see the panelists here and our contact information. If you have any questions, you want to reach out to us directly about something you heard from us, that that's also a welcome. And uh, finally, I want to thank the audience for joining. Uh, it's been great to have you here. Without you, would, there would be no point of doing this. So <laughs> uh, thanks again for everyone uh, coming and checking us out. Take care, thank everyone. You. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Bye.